Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kilowatt. My name is Bodhi, and I am your host. Still trying to find a nice... I love the music. I just haven't figured out how to quite come in with my intro. I'm going to have to change that at some point. But anyway, let's get right to the news, shall we? Rivian has delayed orders for the R1T electric pickup truck until September. It was originally going to be released in July. The R1S was supposed to be released in August, and that's going to come shortly thereafter, according to, <laughs> to Rivian. So sometime after the R1T's release. Um, I'm going to blame COVID and uh, the ship chip shortage for this. GM has announced a recall of the 2017 to 2019 Chevy Bolt EV. The reason for the recall is that the vehicle can catch on fire, which is honestly a pretty good reason for a recall. So far, only two vehicles have actually caught on fire at this point, according to Tesla Roddy. But GM is saying, please don't park your cars in the garage just in case they catch on fire. Does that sound familiar to anything that Hyundai did recently? Anyway, there was initially a recall back in November 2020 of 69,000 bolts, Chevy bolts. <laughs> Realized there are bolts all over that car. But 69,000 Chevy bolts, the actual car itself, in a cruel turn of events, the... Um, uh, the two vehicles that were act that caught on fire that are sparking this whole thing off were actually already repaired as a part of that recall that I was talking about in 2020. So yeah, now the Hyundai Kona is going through something similar as I already mentioned. LG Electronics worked with Chevy on the Bolt. Hyundai uses LG Kim batteries, and I believe they use some other LG technology as well. So these issues may be related. At this time, I don't know that anybody is saying they are definitely related, but I am saying there's a ton of similarities <laughs> when you look at it on the outside. All right, the Hyundai Ionic 5 is a hit, kinda. The Ionic 5 is the best selling car out of all of Hyundai's eco friendly car sales. So I'm just gonna give you some year to date numbers here. The Ionic, the Ionic, the Ionic 5 has sold 16,676 vehicles year to date, which is pretty impressive since it only came out, I think in March. Um, and it didn't even come out in the U S until April or May. So pretty impressive on that. The Kona EV has sold 13,362, which when you consider what's going on with the Kona, also very impressive. The Hyundai Ionic electric, has only sold 6,070 vehicles. The Ionic plug-in hybrid uh, is a, let's see, 4,229 vehicles. The Santa Fe plug-in hybrid has sold 3,487 vehicles. So, you know, um, all of those numbers are relatively close, except for the last one. The the last one made me giggle a little bit and not out of joy. It's just a funny number when you compare it to all the other numbers. But the Hyundai Tucson plug-in electric hybrid EV sold five, a total of five. Um, I will say that I'm a big fan of the Hyundai Ionic 5. And when my kids go back to school, I plan on doing a test drive of that bad boy. Because if the Model 3, the Model Y, or the Cybertruck didn't exist, this is definitely the way I would go in terms of an electric vehicle. Even over the Volkswagen ID.4 or the Mach-E or even uh, Ford's F-150 Lightning, which we're about to talk about here. How was Ford able to get the F-150 Lightning EV to a price that's comparable, compared, comparable, <laughs> comparable, comparable to traditional internal combustion F-150s. So when Ford set out to build the Lightning, they wanted to make sure they had price parity with the other F-150s, legacy F-150s uh, that they currently sell. And they really felt that there's such a premium on EVs that that would be a barrier in terms of price, that that would be a barrier for people to wanna to buy this electric vehicle. And they wanted to take that barrier away. So how did they get the price down because honestly, you know, it's it's quite expensive to buy an EV over a gas vehicle at this point in time. So right now, Ford sells about 4 million F-150s a year. So that means um, they get a really good price on things like seats. You don't need a special seat for an electric vehicle. It's just a seat. You know, there's a lot of that stuff that goes into the Ford Lightning that you don't need 
uh, especially built part four. You know, a seat is a seat, floor mats are floor mats. So they get good price prices on that stuff. And then when it comes down to it, Ford just gets really good prices in general because they t buy a ton of widgets from their suppliers. And I know what you're saying. You're like, hey, dude, what about all the components that are specific to electric vehicles? Well, uh, Ford kind of has that covered too because a lot of the EV related parts share many of the same components that Ford's other EVs like the Mach-E does. So that allows Ford to continue to get the best possible pricing on those parts. And then the last part of this whole thing for the F-150 Lightning is that it has a very limited number of options and that was on purpose. The core truck is pretty consistent throughout each of the models for the Lightning. You basically get more range and a bigger screen as you go up in price. And this helps Ford keep costs down because they don't have to come up with all of those options that you find in the traditional F-150s. I'm sure as the F-150 Lightning matures, they'll start adding those options back in, but they got to get a firm base of production, manufacturing, and delivery down before they can start adding that stuff in. They don't, you don't want to add complication. Tesla, at one point in time, you could add so many things to a Tesla. And then the, finally they got to a point where you can, you know, you can choose your seat color <laughs> and that's about it. Uh, let's get into some Tesla news, shall we? Just some quick follow-up. Model Y deliveries for Europe will start sometime in September. This is according to Clean Technica. Uh, let uh, Tesla's Q2 2021 earnings call will be held on July 2nd, 2021. That's a Monday, so it'll give me lots of time to prepare that week's show, which I'm very grateful because the shows take a lot of work and uh, usually only have a day or two to do it in. So a little bit of extra time is always appreciated. Let's see here. Elon has confirmed that the supercharger network is getting a 250 kilowatt to 300 kilowatt max capacity. We don't really have a timeline or any other details really, because like most things Elon does, it came in the form of a tweet. So not exactly um, a lot of information there, but we do know that this is good news for Tesla owners because they'll be able to charge their vehicles faster. The Model 3 long range dual motor is no longer available in the Chinese configurator. We don't have a reason as to why this is. Model 3 is selling really well in China. Tesla doesn't break out the numbers as to how the Model 3 sells as compared to the Model Y, and they don't really tell us how the Model 3 performance sells as you know, compared to the Model 3 long range. So I would guess that they're probably retooling something and then it'll be back soon. But I, I mean, honestly, who knows? <laughs> Certainly not me. The Model Y long range is sold out Q3 2021 here in the United States. According to Tesla Rati, the Model Y long range is 7 to 11 weeks out. Now, prior to recording this episode, I configured a Model Y long range and I got an estimated delivery time of four to eight weeks. And it didn't matter. I chose all sorts of different kind of paint configurations, tire configurations, four to eight weeks, no matter what I chose. But interestingly enough, when I configured the Model Y performance, it didn't give me an estimated date at all. So... There you go. Breaking news. <laughs> no timeline on the Model Y performance, according to my really poor research on the Tesla website. Let's talk about my favorite subject on this show, the Cybertruck. Elon mentioned that the Cybertruck could be a flop, but he doesn't care because he loves it so much. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, this is great marketing, and I'll tell you why. All of the articles written on this subject say something along the lines in the headline of Elon thinks Cybertruck may fail, but he doesn't care because he's a rogue. Uh, um, I don't know where that R came from. <laughs> I slipped into a little bit of pirate there. And in many of those articles, they mentioned, I haven't read all of them, but many of them mentioned that Tesla has somewhere around a million Cybertruck orders, pre-orders. Now, that's a million pre-orders at $100 a pop. Some of those people are going to fall off. They're just not going to order the Cybertruck. But let's assume that only 250,000 people order the Cybertruck. And on average, they spend $60,000 for their Cybertruck. 
average, right? Some are going to spend more, some are going to spend less, but I don't think that number is crazy, $60,000. That means that Tesla will make right around $15 billion off the Cybertruck. Hardly a failure, hardly a flop. Ultimately, we will see how the Cybertruck sells in 2022. I have a prediction right now that it's going to sell very well. And that's all I have to say about that. I do, however, have one more thing to say about the Cybertruck, and that is the Cybertruck will not have door handles. The car will recognize you as you walk up and through your fob or your phone, and the doors will just open for you. I don't love this idea. There are plenty of times when I'm trying to shuffle the kids out into the vehicle so that we can go to school or whatever event, and I'm like, go get in the car and wait for me while I'm getting the other child ready and to get in the car so that we can leave, um, they can't get in without a key fob or a phone. Like right now, they just walk out to the Mazda, they open the door and they get in the car and they're waiting to go. I mean, no fuss, no muss. The other thing that I don't really love about this idea is that if there's an emergency, getting someone out of the vehicle can be very difficult. One of the things that we do at my job a lot is someone will be passed out behind the wheel of their vehicle, usually at a stoplight. And this is for a variety of reasons. Some might be medical, some might be drug-induced, some might be alcohol-induced, but there's a variety of reasons why it happens. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how we're going to get into that vehicle uh, in terms of a Cybertruck. Normally, we would break a window if we couldn't get in any other way. But the Cybertruck's windows aren't designed to be broken, and there's no door handle and I just don't know how we're going to get in. And as a general rule, we don't like messing around those vehicles because they're in drive. So if this person woke up, they could easily hurt us or somebody else or themselves by just slamming on the gas out of sheer panic. So our preferred method, if we can, is just to open the door. But if we can't, then we take out a window. That's just how it's got to be. We don't want to cause undue damage to somebody's vehicle, but on the other side, we also don't want you to die. And really what this all comes down to is we're just going to have to wait and see what Tesla has come up with. And then I can give you what my final opinion is on the subject. But just from my perspective as a firefighter, I, I don't love that it doesn't have door handles. There have been cars that I've been on uh, for a variety of different reasons, car accidents and things like that that were modified not to have door handles. And I can tell you right now, those cars get damaged uh, way more than they need to be. And it's not because firefighters are like, you don't have door handles, I'm going to teach you a lesson. It's just because you don't have door handles. There's like only a couple ways we're going to get this door open. You couple like bulletproof windows with that, and we're just going to have to take the door off with our extrication tools. And it's going to cost way more than a window. Moving on. Let's talk about Powerwall, shall we? Tesla has a backlog of 80,000 pre-orders for the Powerwall. 80,000. Why is there such a big backlog, you ask? Well, people want them, and there's a global chip shortage, so they can't ramp up production. This is according to Elon. And to be fair, the Powerwall wasn't a huge priority for a lot of its life because, you know, there was production hell. That was just one of the reasons. And then they did the Model Y and they didn't have enough battery cells and, you know, so on and so forth. It actually took Tesla five years to deploy 100,000 Powerwalls. Many more people bought more than one Powerwall. So that's not even a Powerwalls in 100,000 homes. That's just 100,000 Powerwalls. It's probably closer to 60 or 70,000 homes that were actually installed. It's just my uneducated guess there. Now, Elon was talking about the power walls because he was testifying in Delaware because some of Tesla shareholders are suing him for buying Solar City. Their argument is that Elon convinced the board to buy Solar City because Solar City was failing and Elon was an investor in Solar City. So that's why they're suing Elon and Tesla for making that purchase. Now, I'm not here to talk about the lawsuit because honestly, that's not all that interesting to me. But Elon did say while he was testifying that he thinks the Tesla can produce between 30 and 35,000 power walls this quarter, which is quite impressive when you consider. But if you haven't done the math, that those 80,000 pre-orders are worth about $500 million. When you look at Tesla Energy and Q4 2020, Tesla made about $752 million for that fourth quarter. Tesla purchased SolarCity for $2.6 billion. So all in all, uh, it seems like 
they're going to make their money back if they haven't already. I will say, I don't know how much technology they got from Solar City. So maybe they'd be where they are now, even if they hadn't acquired Solar City, that they're going to have to prove that. Anyway, like I said, I'm not here to talk about all that stuff. All right, I have one last story for you here, and I sound a little different because I actually recorded most of this episode on Friday, and then we drove to Palm Springs to visit family, and uh, some news came in while we were on our way. We stopped at Blythe to use the restroom. I happened to check my phone, and Tesla released the full self-driving subscription option somewhere around 7 o'clock last night is when I found out about it. Well, anyway, we made it to Palm Springs a little later. I was exhausted, got to bed at midnight, uh, went to sleep until 8 o'clock this morning. So now I'm here to talk to you about it today. Um, let me pull up the options here. So currently full self-driving, if you buy the package in one-time payment, you're looking at $10,000. That gets you navigate on autopilot, auto lane change, auto park, summon, full self-driving computer, traffic light, and stop sign detection. So that's $10,000. And quite frankly, I think it's way overpriced for something that's in beta. And most people don't even have version nine. A very few amount of people have version nine. Anyway, now you can now subscribe to these features if you don't already have it for $199. You get all of those features. Um, if you purchased enhanced autopilot, which was available for a very short amount of time, you can purchase the upgraded subscription for $99 because you've already paid for part of those features basically is what that ends up being, why it's so much cheaper. My thoughts on this are that if you buy a vehicle, your typical loan is five years. If you pay $200 a month for this subscription, you're going to hit $10,000 and rider right just a little over four years, maybe four years and a couple of months. Um, so it makes more sense when you're buying the vehicle to just go ahead and pay for the service outright, just wrap it into your loan or pay for it cash. However, you're going to do that be, unless you're not going to keep the car very long, then that's a totally different scenario. But for me, I keep my car for 10 years, so it doesn't make any sense at all for me to go with this subscription plan. Now, if you didn't get the full self-driving when you bought the car and it's, you know, it's expensive and you're like, well, I don't really know if I want to pay for it or not, um, then that makes sense to do the subscription. I, I do think having options is a good um, thing for owners. I just think where autopilot is right now or where full self-driving is right now, that $10,000 is a little overpriced. My, this is my personal belief. I think it should be between five and seven and seven is like a, 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 a ridiculous number that I would almost not consider buying it <laughs> if it was me, right? Right now I have uh, the Cybertruck reservation and I am locked in at $7,000, uh, but I, I'm reluctantly going to pay that money for the the the... the the service. Now, what we need is legacy automakers and new um, EV makers to actually come in and start competing with Tesla with full self-driving and these prices will come down. And I fully believe at some point they're going to come down because other automakers are going to catch up, but they are just really far behind at this point. And I know at some event that Elon had said that automakers are two years behind. That event was two years ago in 2019. I just watched it recently. I think it, it wasn't battery day. It was the, you know, it doesn't matter. It was a while ago. The technology has it advanced, has advanced in such a way th because of what Tesla is doing and what other companies are doing that it's not going to be too long before other manufacturers are probably not that they won't necessarily have parity with Tesla, but they will be pretty good. And hopefully, fingers crossed, you know, they compete on uh, services and also price. And hopefully that'll bring the full self-driving down for Tesla. I'd like to know your thoughts on whether or not you think $199 a month is too much. It's the right price. Let me know. It's Bodie, B-O-D-I-E at 918digital.com.
All right, everyone, that is our show this week. I do have some uh, odds and ends that I need to go over if you could be so kind just to kind of hang out with me here. First up, I uploaded the thank you for the patrons this month to the ACAST intro section. And when I went back, I was played that same stupid, if you want to support this show, uh, which I really don't want to be there, um, it was not what I had recorded. It was something completely different. So that's irritating. Um, I'm still working on that. So I'm going to play the thank you to the patrons right now. Hello, everyone. It's a new month, and I would like to thank our Patreon supporters. And in a happy coincidence, we have a new Patreon supporter, Isaiah. Isaiah, welcome to the community, and thank you for supporting the show. I'd also like to thank Anthony, Howard, Jessica, Peter, Bruce, Elon Muskie, Rolando, Tommaso, Adam, Vanilla Wafer, Ryan, Karen, Chip, Chris, Sierra, Dale, Don, Cameron, Nate, Mark and James. Thank you everybody very much for supporting the show. I really appreciate it. And I really mean that. I appreciate all of you more than you know. All right. I just want to say one last time, thank you so much to everyone who supports the show on Patreon. You can go to patreon.com forward slash kilowatt and get an ad free version of the show if you so choose. All right. What next up? Let's see. Oh, let's talk about ads. <laughs> so I have found out, uh, working through some stuff with ACAST, that I have very little control over the ads that go on the show, which is frustrating. And I wrote a very frustrated email uh, documenting those frustrations. So I'm not going to go into it here. It was just like, there's a lot. Um, they're a fine company. Their support is fine. Uh, very nice people. It's just some of the things they do were not labeled on their website. And you don't really find out until you actually start paying them money and you transfer your show over. So that's a little frustrating to me as a content creator. So here's the deal. Um, there is going to be ads on this show. If you're a Patreon supporter, you don't have to worry about it unless you listen to the uh, regular show and not the Patreon feed, but there's going to be ads on the show. There's going to be one ad spot in the beginning of the show, one ad spot after the news, but before our main topic. So if that sounds confusing, what I usually do with the show is I have all of the EV news, regular EV news up at the top. And then I have a section for Tesla. And at the very end is the thing that I want that, that has the most meat, the thing that I want to talk about most, I think is most important. This week was the 80,000 power walls, for instance. So there's going to be ads um, in those spots and there'll be one ad at the end. Now, don't worry because you're probably not going to hear three ads. Some people will hear no ads. Some people we will hear one. Some people might hear two. Um, I don't have any control over that. I would really like you to only hear one or two. But like I said, uh, they don't give me that kind of access. And because they don't give me that kind of access, I just kind of have to put all three spots in for ads. And hopefully one of those spots gets filled and I get paid. But I'm trying to place the ads in a way that's not going to affect your listening experience. So that's why I'm doing it this way. If you have thoughts, please go ahead and email me, Bodie, B-O-D-I-E at 918digital.com. I would love to hear your thoughts. And then we have one last thing. Uh, a couple, few weeks ago, we had Allison and Steve on from podfeet.com. And we chatted about what they didn't really like about their Teslas, which was pretty minor, honestly, but it was a good interview. And I would highly encourage you if you haven't listened to it to go back and listen to it. But anyway, Allison and Steve got solar installed on their house and on Nozilla cast number 843, and I'll put a link in the show notes. Allison goes through that whole process that they went through to get install a uh, solar installed on their house. I highly encourage everyone to go and check it out because I, I, as somebody who has solar on my house and, and talk about this stuff all the time, found it very interesting how other places do it. And then also, if you're somebody who's thinking about solar or you know someone who's thinking about solar, this is a great resource for them. Again, it's Nozilla Cast number 843, link in the show notes. Go check it out for, you know, a variety of reasons. But the biggest reason to check it out is I adore Allison and Steve. They're such sweet people. You should go and definitely listen to the Nozilla cast. All right, everybody, that is it for me. I hope you have a wonderful week. You can email me, Bodie, B-O-D-I-E, at 918digital.com. You can also find me on Twitter at 918digital. And I... <laughs> 
I feel like I have to apologize. My brain has been going so slow lately. Uh, we've had some late nights at work and I feel um, I'm feeling it. Like I'm 46 years old, almost 47, and my brain does not necessarily work so good on lack of sleep and it takes me longer to recover. And it just so happens that my schedule is in a way that I'm recording this show, but I'm still not <laughs> recovered. I don't know. Words are coming. Uh, words are so hard for me right now. Let's just put it that way. It is so hard for me to think on my feet. Um, but thank you guys for being patient. I really appreciate it. Uh, lots of people sent off some kind words about last week's episode. And I honestly thought last week's episode with, was a bag of hot garbage. But everybody who, who sent an email saying that they liked it, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, folks. Uh, have a wonderful week. Uh, I appreciate each and every single one of you. Please be safe. And I will talk to you next Friday. Bye.